Welcome to a new episode of the Tolkien Experience Podcast. I'm Luke Shelton. I'm Sarah Westwick. And I'm Sarah Brown. Each episode, we share with you an interview of a Tolkien scholar or fan. That's right. In these interviews, one of us asks our guests to respond to six questions that help us learn about their personal Tolkien experience. All of this is made possible by our supporters on Patreon. So we want to thank them and encourage you to check out the community at patreon.com slash Tolkien experience. We are so excited to share this podcast with you. So without any more delay, let me introduce our guest. For this episode of the Tolkien Experience podcast, I was fortunate enough to sit down and talk with my friend Alicia Fox Lins. Alicia is very active in the Mythopaic Society, where she serves on the Council of Stewards, as well as serves as their social media officer. We all know how busy that position can be, especially now with um, all the news kicking up around Amazon series. Um, So she puts in a lot of effort there to to keep things above board, Uh, but somehow she's also found time to start editing a collection about Tolkien and gaming, both tabletop games and video games, that's supposed to be released later this year. Uh, I'm very excited to share this conversation with my friend with you. And so without any more ado, let's get right into the interview. Alicia, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, So let's dive right into our first question. Uh, How were you introduced to Tolkien's work? Oh, thank you for having me. Um, I was introduced to Tolkien's work when I was in ninth grade. So I was, you know, 14 years old. And there was a teacher at my high school and his name was Mr. Van Hoyk. And I was obsessed with him. It was definitely a, a... teenager crush on professor kind of situation but and I spent way too much time in his office trying to make him like me and one of his suggestions to me after he got to know me a little bit was that I should read these books because there was a movie that was about to come out that was going to ruin them so I needed to read them right then it was exactly what I needed in my life at that moment so I uh, convinced my mother to buy a copy of the book that I still have. It's in eight different pieces. The binding immediately fell apart. It's the um, 1999 uh, edition for the Science Fiction Club. That was uh, the dust jacket was done by Donato Giancola, which I didn't realize until much later on in my fandom. I read it um, in about a week and was immediately obsessed and I got to the end and then immediately started reading it again. And that was a couple of months before the movies came out. And then I watched the movies with my mother and uh, my mom got so upset when Gandalf died that she demanded that I spoiled the next two movies for her. Cause she didn't realize they were going to be three movies <laughs> and she was just incensed and had to know if Gandalf came back or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think that's a lot of us we're, we're like, what? And we're like flipping forward. Like, come on, this can't be a thing. <laughs> yeah. She was, oh, I just can't even, we walked out of the theater and she was like, what do you know about what happens in this? And I was like, well, I've read the books a few times at this point. I know what happens. Do you want me to spoil it? (laughs) And she was like, absolutely. Gandalf's the best character. Indeed. Gandalf is the best character. (laughs) Yeah. Well, in the movies, certainly like I, I, I also read the books before the films came out and, for the most part, I've been able to hold on to like my visuals of the characters separate from the movies, but Ian McKellen crushed it as Gandalf. So, so he is Gandalf to me now. Yeah, exactly. Um, Ian McKellen also, there's this one particular mannerism that he does, uh, when he says witless worm in, uh, the, the Hobbit movies, he does this thing with his mouth that is exactly the same as something that my grandfather used to do with his mouth. Mm. And um, one of the things that like kind of threw me back into Tolkien fandom later on was I was grieving my grandfather a lot. Mm. So I just watched the Lord of the Rings movies constantly on repeat because being able to see Ian McKellen as Gandalf was like being able to see my grandfather again. Hmm. Yeah. I, um, was kind of going through the same thing this um, in, in 2020 during the pandemic 
Um, I lost actually, I actually lost all four grandparents in about a year and a half. Um, and so going through the, the Lord of the Rings, I just happened to be rereading it with a student at that time. And then, you know, at the end of the book, the student's like, well, like what happens? Cause <laughs> Sam is just like, well, I'm back. And it's like, what happened? So we naturally went on into some of the appendices and just reading, um, Eowyn scream out for Aragorn after he dies, uh, screaming out Estelle, Estelle just is heart rending when you're in that mindset. Um, so yeah, I totally get that, that ah, somehow there's that resonance with, with grief and loss throughout Tolkien's work that just, man, when you're looking for it, it's there so powerfully. Yeah, I 100% agree. I've started rereading uh, Fellowship a couple of times since the pandemic started, and I honestly haven't been able to get all the way through Fellowship yet. I, I want to, and it's, as I'm reading it, way different things stand out to me now than they used to, but it's it's still, I'm not quite in the right mindset to go through Two Towers and Return of the King yet. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think for my next reread this summer, I might have to use audiobook to get through it. <laughs> no, that's fair. Um, most of the reading I'm doing right now, we're kind of skipping around. I'm, I'm doing this Springs of Power book club thing where we're just reading huh. everything Tolkien wrote about the second age. So we've gone through some of the appendices and now we're deep into Unfinished Tales and Silmarillion stuff, which is easier for me to read because I don't have the same emotional attachment to the Silmarillion than I, as I do to the Lord of the Rings because the Lord of the Rings is by far my favorite. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, a great idea to do ahead of the, the Amazon series coming out. Just, you know, what what is the background that we have? What is the scaffolding that we can put around the story? Because obviously they're going to make a lot of it up because they have to. But, you know, it would be really fascinating to compare just like you're doing. Um, have you in doing that process, have you come across anything fun or interesting that you had either forgotten about or didn't know when you started? I've been made very aware this like read through of the second age stuff, how conflicted Tolkien seems to have been about the monarchy and colonialism, which is a really deep thing to (laughs) immediately jump into. But he, I mean, that's what Numenor is. It's a colonial power that comes and like reseeds middle earth and subjugates the people who live there who were already being subjugated by Sauron. And the way that he deals with that, you can tell that he, one, has this ingrained British monarchy, empire, like way of thinking about things, but he also seems to be in some ways pushing against it. And I find that really interesting, uh, both because of the backlash and how people generally speak about Tolkien being, oh, well, he's a British Catholic you know, first of all, over everything else. And also just given where we are as a Western society in 2022, <laughs> uh, it's interesting to see that the, these kind of under threads have, they date all the way back to, you know, the early 1900s, whether he was intentionally working in that sort of plot line slash uh, conflict or not you can definitely see that it's there and that is something that he's dealing with. Yeah. And, and he's definitely always dealing with that. It's just not as apparent in his more popular works. Like he definitely sets up a monarchy in Lord of the Rings, but he also has other communities that aren't monarchies like the Shire that, you know, it's just like a kind of loose commune. I mean, they have a mayor, but mayor doesn't really do much, but you know, So he has these different models in his mind. He just doesn't bring them into direct conflict nearly as often in the Lord of the Rings as he does in his other texts. Um, Yeah. Yeah. It's also been really interesting to me to see how Tolkien relies on external uh, groups of people coming in and becoming the ruling class of other people a lot. He does that in, uh, 
you know, the elves from Valinor who, who come over and then start kind of like lording over the the, the dark elves like uh, Galadriel and uh, Celeborn and their little elf commune. Also with uh, Thranduil, um, he does it kind of with the hobbits but not quite so overtly because you have like that fallow hide strand of the hobbits who are more adventurous and kind of they're there's kind of seen as being outsiders but they're rich so it's okay and they therefore kind of become the master of buckland the great took all of that um it happens with the numenorians as well because the men from numenor end up lording over the men of middle earth I, I don't know why exactly i find that interesting but it is something i really picked up on this time that i find interesting and i want to look up to see if there's any actual research that's been done around that because if mm. there hasn't been i'm gonna do it at this point <laughs> yeah yeah it's to me you know i i've i've talked about that with some people just casually who, you know, just other friends. And to me, it, it's worrying that that does tend to coincide with the conversations about like bloodline and inheritance um, that you get about like, you know, um, when it talks about, you know, the, the blood runs almost pure in Denethor or in Varamir. And it's like, that's a little, you know, if, if we're, if we're talking about like family and, and it's really starting to sound like either racialized or like, um, you know, a, a, what am I trying to say? A, a, an inherited ruling class in a way, um, that's not great. <laughs> yeah. And then he turns all of that on his head with Sam, like Sam being the, uh, you know, the lower class soldier that comes back from World War One and then starts that whole uh, upheaval in the social structure of Britain. And Sam is kind of the example of that in the work. So it's he's dealing with a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he is. <laughs> um, so that was a great answer to our first question. <laughs> so <Sorry>, we. <laughs> We officially got a little off topic there, but <laughs> oh, I'm um, sorry. It's going to continue. <laughs> well, no, this is great. Like, really, the questions are just meant to be scaffolding for us to have fun around. Um, so, when you think about the different times that you have approached Tolkien, does one stand out to you as like your favorite? Whether that's a certain time reading the book or a certain time watching the films. That is really hard to answer just because I watched the films so much and I've read the books so much. Um, one of my claims to fame is that we hold a yearly uh, 21 hour, all six movies, Middle Earth Marathon. That is uh, Jeopardy famous. I am aware I've been there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, it's also a drinking game. It's just bad news. Don't do it. Uh, but so, like, none of those, I watch the movies all the time, and I've actually gotten, like, a lot of really good ideas out of that. I have a tattoo that has actually come out of that Middle Earth marathon, but I'm always inebriated during it, and I don't actually get a lot out of the movies other than just, uh, you know, um, Mystery Science Theater 3000-ing them. Uh, as much as I love them, specifically the Hobbit movies get a little roasty when we're watching them. I, and I really like that kind of atmosphere and that way of dealing with it because so much of the other times that I'm interacting with Tolkien and his work, I'm very serious because I do a lot of scholarship around it. So that's, it's nice, but it's not like my, f yeah. Um, I, I can't say that that is my favorite way of watching the movies or my favorite time of watching the movies, although it is a nice breath of fresh air um, because I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent there. Right. Um, mm -hmm. My favorite time watching the movies were probably that first time I watched them in the theater, because you're never going to really get that first viewing experience back again. Um, and just like the sheer wonder of being catapulted into Tolkien's middle earth. And because 
Peter Jackson did such a good job with the material culture there. It really does feel like you're inside Middle Earth, even if there are things that he did in the adaptation that I do not agree with because he did for him real dirty. Um, <laughs> and reading the books is... I read them so often just over and over the first few times I read them, they all kind of blend in together. I would say probably my favorite time actually reading the books would have been, um, <laughs> I'm very sorry. This is kind of dark. I got run over by a truck when I was in my late twenties and that's kind of what catapulted me into doing actual Tolkien scholarship because I needed to hmm. do something like, constructive with my life and um i couldn't i had just gotten run over right so i wasn't like able to go out and do a bunch of physical things so i really just delved into tolkien and that time reading the books through right after that i really got the full sense of capital e escape hmm yeah. And it was like really the only thing that took me out of, oh, well, I'm weak and useless and can't do anything. Right. And it was magical, honestly. Hmm. Yeah. That sounds like a really meaningful experience. Um, it really was. And I'm hoping that at some point I'll be able to not necessarily recreate that, but kind of go through that again when I can actually make it all the way through. <laughs> after mm. 2020 <laughs> yeah <laughs> um you said that this was perhaps the, the thing that kind of catapulted you into into scholarship so so what was it about this time that made you want to do scholarship instead of just uh, reliving it as a fan uh, a number of things um i i'm a uh, a graphic designer um, i'm an art director right now so i do I make things pretty for a living is generally how I explain it to people. And I was in a job that I wasn't very happy with and I didn't feel like I was getting anywhere. And as a lot of people who go into the creative field do, I have been, I had been second guessing what I had decided to do with my life. And I was like, well, geez, I really should have gone into science because that was my uh, other thing that I was interested in doing, which I understand most people wouldn't be choosing between art and science, but I was, which is why I married a scientist. And I was really stuck in a lot of, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. And I had been watching Lord of the Rings a lot because I was still in the process of really grieving my grandfather. And I was watching the appendices of the of the movies and they had an interview with Tom Shippey and I was like that's the thing people do I could just study Tolkien I wonder if I could actually do that and then I I did some googling I came upon uh, Signum University I found out that you can actually just study Tolkien I uh, enrolled in some classes I met a bunch of really good people I've now gotten uh, a lot of hooks in me in regards to Tolkien scholarship. And I don't think that I could give it up now, if I, even if I wanted to. <laughs> yeah. So um, when you approach Tolkien's work, what is it that kind of uh, resonates with you the most? What is your, your kind of favorite part of the work? If you could nail it down to one thing. This is a little weird for me because usually when I read stuff I or when I'm watching movies, I'm doing it for character development. And that is 100% not why I read Tolkien because, I mean, there isn't any <laughs> unless you're looking at Galadriel over the course of multiple volumes. I was really taken with uh, the way that Tolkien describes the natural world, which is not something that a lot of people enjoy. I feel like I would have loved going on walks with him and having him stop and talk about a tree for 15 minutes. Um, what I like about it is that it's richly descriptive without being very prescriptive in its descriptions, which is why I think there are so many really good artists doing really good work surrounding the Legendarium and none of it looks the same. 
Like I get really vivid pictures in my head when I read his work and they don't look like anything that I've ever seen anyone else do. And I also know that I'm not a good enough painter to do it myself. <laughs> but I, I find that amazing. I actually really, really like the way you phrase that, that, that he's so descriptive without being perfect. Yeah, he can describe like, he'll describe a tree and it will draw it in my brain, but he never goes into the specific texture of the bark or how the branches are unfurling. And, and you think that he is. Because of the way he writes it, because of how engaged you are with it, it feels like he is actively describing every single leaf on this tree, but he's not. And I, I find that really masterful, honestly, like how we can paint such a very clear picture without giving you all of the things you would need to construct that picture. And you still feel like you got it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's it's a. It's something that um, has really interested me, and, and it, it was a question that I explored a little bit with um, some of my studies. Um, I realized, because uh, you, you're aware of my, my PhDs somewhat, but you know, I was doing interviews with a bunch of different readers, and I realized in those interviews, some people saw... Um, the descriptions in Lothlorien of golden leaves as just like, okay, gold is just like a metaphor for yellow. So it's just yellow leaves. But then other people saw gold as like a literal thing. So like the leaves were like shiny metallic gold. Um, and so I uh, went back and I asked my different participants to, 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 you know, you know, weigh in on one side or the other. And there is no consensus. Like, like about a third of people see it as shiny metallic gold. Um, and so it, it goes back to exactly what you're talking about. Like gold can be either one of those things. There's no right answer, quote unquote. So it leaves this kind of room for breathing your own interpretation into the work like you're talking about. Um, I think that's honestly part of some of the pushback that the movies got because Jackson did a really good job of making it look like Middle Earth. But I mean, he made it look like his Middle Earth and that wasn't everyone's Middle Earth. It's pretty close to my Middle Earth, honestly. And at this point, it, it is hard to divorce the two unless I'm actively reading the book. I can push Jackson aside for the most part. But yeah, uh, th that is really interesting. I don't think I ever read them as actual metallic leaves, but I did read them as not just gold or yellow leaves. Like something was obviously magical there. So they were more than what a normal golden leaf would be. Well, I'm going to be thinking about that one for a while. Well, and it's the same with the bark. He says silver bark and some people see it as like gray or white and some people see it as like actually silver. Um, so, yeah, it, it's really fascinating and, and nothing I had thought about until I'm asking dozens of different people and this just pops up and I'm like, wait, is this a thing? <laughs> um, and so, you know, we've kind of talked a little bit about you know, the, the ins and outs and ways that it can be interpreted. Um, and so naturally this kind of leads to, to us uh, talking about, you know, an interpretation that's coming up. Um, and, and you mentioned the Amazon interpretation a little bit earlier, leading into your uh, talking about your book group. Um, there's a lot of conversation out there right now. Some of it good, a lot of it not great um, about <laughs> about choices being made and interpretations being made. And it, it is interesting to me the the number of people who have read into the books what they wanted to read into the books. And then they have decided that's what Tolkien said. Um, so it would be like like me saying, well, I read the leaves as yellow. So the leaves are yellow and it's like, no, he, he says golden leaves. So you, you, there's some wiggle room there, you know, and, 
and it's just fascinating to me the number of people who like it's just go back and read exactly what he said does he say what you're saying he said <laughs> or is that just you reading into it and and it's fascinating to me the the amount of people who are so dead set in their interpretation it doesn't leave room for other interpretations yeah and at the risk of possibly offending people i think that a lot of it is just a lack of self-awareness they don't realize that they are imposing their own views on what it is that they're reading because to be able to divorce oh my god i've done so much reading about like audience reception and how oh my god and just how like the meaning of a text isn't within the text it is within the actual reader uh and that's not necessarily something that i I believe because I come from a fine art background, I think that the meaning of a text is a dialogue between the person who created it and the person who's reading it through the thing that they're interacting with, just slightly different. But a lot of people never think about that. They just think, oh, well, these are words on a page and I've read these words and this is how those words present themselves to me and stop there and don't think about the fact that those words could be read a, a hundred, a thousand different ways. Like people get really upset when, I don't know, people suggest that uh, Frodo and Sam might have a romantic relationship because they didn't read it that way, but there's a bunch of queer people who did read it that way. And who's to say that they're wrong because they're interacting with the same text and just taking different things from it and to be able to have the self-awareness to pull yourself out of your default way of thinking is just not something a lot of people have mm -hmm. yeah well and also there is is that's a window into a conversation about cultural differences as well because you know of course we're talking about a man writing in the early 1900s and the the ways of showing affection between men has shifted over time but the cultural awareness that we have now is that the way that affection can be shown using those same um gestures those same um close embraces things like that can be coded a completely different way in our modern context and so it's like you know we are modern readers. It's okay to read things with our own modern context. Yes, if we want to, we can go look at it in his context and, and the writer's context and the way that he might have intended it to be. But both are valid. The, one doesn't invalidate the other. Um, and, and that goes back to, you know, knowing yourself, but also knowing that the the the... The, the I'm trying not to use unnecessarily large, large words. <laughs> the, the world changes over time. Uh, the way people think about certain things uh, in one decade isn't this, the way they think about it in another decade. Um, I'm trying to get away from like milieu or zeitgeist. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say the cultural milieu. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yeah, I, I think a lot of people really internalize, um, that sort of cultural th way of thinking about things without realizing that they've done it, which, which goes back to they don't understand that they are putting their own specific views on this work, which is why I also also a part of why I don't think you should completely discount authorial intent, although I don't think it's the end all be all, because there's also some of that sub subconscious cultural stuff working its way in through the author that's also working its way in from the reader and i think that interaction is really the most interesting one is when you are plugging into like unspoken cultural truths from the time that it was being written and being able to react to those as a modern person i think you're getting to like a bigger like almost capital T truth there that you might not be getting if you're just trying to focus on what the author actually intended. And I, I personally talk to a lot of people who think that I'm crazy for thinking that. <laughs> I know a lot of death to the author type people. 
when I was in uh, undergrad as as an English major, and and I basically did English because English is an excuse to study a lot of different things. <laughs> basically, like if you want to get into psychology, sure, you can get into psychology and apply it to this one book. If you want to get into biology and apply it to science fiction, go for that and do that over there. If you want to, you know, it. You don't have to be an expert in things to be like, hey, here's some cool nifty things. <laughs> but um, as a as an undergrad, I had to take this course that was all about, you know, uh, theory and different approaches and things like that. And the one thing that uh, that that professor ground into us was um, the the three different uh, sources of meaning for a text. And, and it's typically depicted as like a triangle and you have the author on one side of the triangle, the reader on the other side of the triangle and the text at the top of the triangle. And basically any different a critical approach to a text situates itself somewhere on this triangle. So like reader response is firmly in the reader makes the interpretation. Authorial intent is firmly in the author, you know, and, and, and new critical says the text me has all the meaning. Um, but you have to be self-aware to say, okay, yeah, I'm doing a reader response thing. Do I think that only the reader's response matters all the time? No, I, I don't. I think it's a seriously important part, but I think the text is a seriously important part. And I do think that the author has a seriously important part to play as well. Uh, I think your your explanation is kind of a dialogue is, is a really informative one in that way of they're all pieces to, to, to go together to make meaning in some way. And it differs greatly from reader to reader how those pieces go together. Um, and, you know... Whenever I come across someone who is, you know, dead set into authorial intent, the one thing that drives me nuts that I, I always come back to is even the best writer in the world can fail. Like it, even if he wanted to um, create the scene and he put all his words down perfectly, occasionally it's not going to land for a reader. It's just not. And so we can't 100% say we know what the author intended because maybe he was having an off day, <laughs> you know, like it, it just happens. We're all human. So we can't say the author is perfect. We can't say the author can perfectly convey his own wants, desires, wishes through the text, because how many of us can actually do that? <laughs> um, now, I would contend some of us like Tolkien are much better at it than others, but that's not to say he did it with a hundred percent accuracy all the time. Um, and, and so that's, so one, there's also, sorry. <laughs> I, I was just going to say that's, that's my biggest hang up with the whole authorial intent thing. There, there's also the fact that to be able to discern what the authorial intent is, you have to read and interpret what the author wrote or said about what their authorial intent is. Like you can't, bring yourself out of that enough to really know what his authorial intent is because my god just bring up letters even if there weren't letters that directly contradicted other letters and therefore you can just pick and choose whatever it is that you want to think that tolkien was doing you still are having to read those letters and discern what it is that you think that he was trying to do. And that's really the part about reader response and reading all of that theory that really got me <laughs> like really wrapping my head around the fact that th there is nothing that I can consume that I don't put a shade of myself onto. Um, absolutely. And, and, you know, he even if he's telling you what his meaning is, who's to say he's telling you the only meaning? Um, and, and that goes back to your ideas about the contra your, your uh, mentioning the contradictions in the letters. Tolkien says different things to different people because he knows he's writing to people wanting to know different things. And so he kind of puts different spins on it and, and what he thinks either would appeal to them or uh, push them away or whatever he's trying to do to that, that person he's writing to. <laughs> uh, I just, I, I love the letters. I love them so much because they give you like a glimpse of what a curmudgeonly old man Tolkien really was. And I feel that deep in my soul, but I also hate the letters because my God, every time I get into a, uh, 
a debate with anyone out trots the letters and it's someone misquoting something or taking it completely out of context or not realizing that like five pages in the future something else completely different is being said and like maybe we shouldn't keep trotting out these letters as actual proof of literally anything yeah yeah um because well <clears throat> i used to have a professor uh of education who would say if if there was one way to teach everyone something, we would have figured it out a long time ago. Um, and, and I think that applies here. If if there was one answer to the interpretation of Tolkien's work, we would have figured it out a long time ago. Um, and in fact, if there was, there would be no need for scholarship because it'd be like, there you go. Everyone has the meaning. We're done. We can move on. And you know what? Frankly, I think Tolkien's work would die because of that. If we're not talking and engaged with it and trying to figure out new things about it, it just ceases to be relevant. Um, and so I think it's a good thing that we have all these different interpretations and readings and views and perspectives uh, because it gives it dialogue. It gives it life to continue. Yeah. Tolkien's work has just uh, so much applicability uh, to modern life. And I, I think a lot of it has to do with like what he lived through. He lived through kind of, I'm going to say early modern and not mean it in the scholarly way, but like, you know, like the early 20th century, like the industrial revolution, all of that, when the world as we know it now kind of came into being, he lived through multiple uh, mechanized wars. It's something that remains applicable specifically um, to uh, Americans, which I think is a little weird. And it's one of the things that I've been grappling with lately is that whenever I read Tolkien's work, I'm reading it as an American, because uh, I've been talking a lot more to British people about Tolkien lately, and how their views of him are very different from my views. Like when I read about Tolkien and colonialism, what I'm thinking about is how this country started. Like whenever Tolkien talks about going into the West as someone who was born in America, all I can think of is people, you know, sailing to America, which is strange. And yeah, I, I don't, I lost the train to the track of where I was going with that, but um, yeah, it's just, there's so much the applicability there's so much there and one of the things that uh, i was i've written about previously is how there kind of is a resurgence specifically in the u.s because that's what i've been uh, looking at of tolkien surrounding like conflict like go global conflict um I mean, partially because that's when the unauthorized paperbacks came out around Vietnam. That's when the movies came out around 9-11. Uh, but it also, there was a huge resurgence uh, of specifically Lord of the Rings memes, which is kind of niche, but that happened around 2020. A lot of people seem to be going back to it because he wrote something that is comforting at times of great distress in a way that not a lot of other things are like it doesn't gloss over the badness and it doesn't necessarily neatly tie everything up but there's just some like inner hope in it that i think appeals to people mm -hmm. um so i i am active over on twitter and um there there's this kind of community that has dubbed itself gay hobbit twitter um and oh my god so that i i am i know some people in that in that community and and i it was fascinating to watch them have kind of that realization of how tolkien has become uh much more relevant to several people in that community through the pandemic through through uh, being shut in and those kinds of things revisiting tolkien and finding more meaning in that so you know i think it's i think that's a, a great observation and it's it's interesting to see people in those movements becoming self-aware and saying, wait, why is Tolkien so important now? And, and starting to, to do some of that analysis you were talking about earlier, like, okay, let me check in with myself and figure out why, why I'm feeling certain ways around this book. Um, 
And, and I, I would definitely recommend Gay Hobbit Twitter. It is it is a very uh, jovial place. Um, if it's half as good as Black Twitter, I am on board. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, again, we have uh, I, I have let us get derailed. I'm not not being a very good <laughs> host tonight. Um, but one one thing I am fascinated about hearing is is you've given us glimpses of. Um, kind of anchor points in your uh, experience with Tolkien where, you know, you, you explored it in, in ninth grade and then you, you got to the movies and, and you engaged with it a lot there with your mother. And then you had this, this uh, accident that, that um, made you get more involved in the scholarship. I, I'm, I'm curious how, how has your reading of Tolkien changed through that time? Uh, it might be more scholarly, but what, what does that look like in practice? It's honestly very hard for me to pull myself out of specifically the Lord of the Rings to read it in a slower, more scholarly way. Um, I have what I have deemed my beater copy of uh, Lord of the Rings. That is a paperback that I just write in as I'm reading, because if I don't actively think, oh, I should write that down and actually do it, I'm just not going to do it. I'll think, oh, yeah, that's a good point. I should write that down as something I should explore. And then I'll be 20 pages down and be like, oh, what? Where? What was I thinking that I should actually think about? Um yeah, so it, it's it's difficult for me to do that. Not so much with The Hobbit, not so much with The Silmarillion, because I can't read The Silmarillion quickly to begin with, because it's like reading the Bible in a lot of ways. But one of the things that's really changed the way that I do interact with any of the books when I read them is going to conferences, honestly, and listening to other people talk about thoughts they've had while they were reading it. And it will give me more things to think about while I'm reading through. Like I went to um, the Popular Culture Association's national meeting, which I was going to pretty regularly before 2020 happened. And I sat through this amazing presentation about Eowyn as a genderqueer icon and I had never thought of it like that before, which is honestly a little bit strange to me because I am genderqueer. And I was, I immediately latched onto that. And the next time I read through um, the whole Dernhelm thing and, and Eowyn beforehand, it, it gave me a lot more context. And I could, I could see where they came up with those conclusions. And I was on board and that is now my headcanon. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's mostly, I, I do still read The Lord of the Rings for pleasure, and that is different than reading it for writing papers and doing presentations. And to be honest, a lot of it is just, I'm writing a paper, and then I remember that something has happened in Lord of the Rings, and vaguely where it is, because I've read it so many times, and then I'm just like, all right. It's probably around page 247, so just flip there, and then I'm just scanning to figure out, just basically to confirm my own bias, and that's not how I should say that at all, <laughs> but to get the quote that I need for the paper. And that's honestly a kind of joyless way of reading it, and I, I don't really recommend people go into scholarship <laughs> if they don't want to really look at the the way the sausage is made and that can strip the joy out of it for you. It doesn't have to, but it definitely can. You know, it's, I have to like turn off a part of my brain to be able to just read it for pleasure at this point. Yeah, no, I, I agree that there is something when you study it, that, you have to find a way to recreate the distance in order to enjoy it again. Um, and I, I do have, I actually had uh, a friend who is a literature person and they love science fiction. They love fantasy, but they refuse, absolutely refuse um, to do any kind of scholarship on science fiction or fantasy um, because they, they want to keep that as their, 
hobby. Um, instead, they focus on um, Cuban and Russian literature. <laughs> uh, and they just keep science fiction and fantasy as fun. And I'm like, all right, fine, fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I totally get that. And like, that's why when I went into art, I went into an applied art, like design, because I didn't want to ruin painting for myself. Mm. Is as soon as that is, as soon as you categorize something as work, it becomes work. And I don't ever want painting to become work. <laughs> mm. Mm-hmm. So um, the last thing I wanted to talk to you about is kind of what you're working on now that um, we can get excited about as uh, people within the Tolkien fan community or scholarly community. I know that you are a steward at the Mythopaic Society. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your role there? Yeah, sure. I am the social media steward of the Mythopoeic Society. I got kind of tapped to do it about seven years ago now, which is crazy for me to think about because it does not feel like it was that long ago at all. Um, I run their (laughs) Facebook page, their Twitter, um, and most uh, important to me specifically, because it's the most exciting thing that we run, we have a Discord server, which is where we are doing the Rings of Power book club. And our next... uh, Our next reading is on Memorial Day weekend, and we do it every two weeks. We're about to do uh, The Mariner's Wife, um, which has been really funny for me because it's my uh, husband's first time through Unfinished Tales, and he is finding it to be a slog. Um, But yeah, the Discord server is great. We have, um, obviously, the, the reading club, and there's a good group of people who were there who um, don't get into ridiculous fights about the Amazon series like we sometimes get in the Facebook group. Um, And we uh, sometimes have virtual components to conferences on there. We have uh, a winter online midwinter seminar the OMS is what we're calling it and our, we have one coming up in like next February of 2023 that's going to be called fantasy goes to hell it's going to be a scholarship surrounding uh, fantasy and depictions of hell and uh, we will have a virtual component to our normal uh, conference MythCon that happens this summer and that will be happening late July into early August. And some of that will end up going on to the discord as well. Uh, It's also in person in Albuquerque and we have a virtual virtual track of that, which will be over zoom, which is our first year of doing a kind of hybrid conference. And I'm, curious excited and concerned about (laughs) what that might bring to us um but yeah it it, i think it's going to be really good and uh, one of the things that i specifically am tasked with doing is kind of building up specifically uh younger membership to the society because the mythopoeic society is the oldest tolkien fan group in north america and uh we need some some fresh blood, <laughs> as it were. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and I also wanted to ask if, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit more about your personal research as well. I, I know that you uh, are working on a, a, a book that you, you hope to have out later this year. Would you mind telling us about that? Yes. Uh, One of the things that I focus on uh, with Tolkien is adaptation. And I am doing a, or I am editing a volume of uh, Tolkien's influence on gaming, both tabletop and video games. Um, And it's going to be fantastic. All of the authors I've had submit things, it's all been really good. I'm so excited about getting this out of my hands, to be perfectly honest, because it has taken me a very long time because I did not know what I was getting into when I was like, yeah, sure, I'll edit a volume. It'll be great. Indexing is the worst. (laughs) But it should be out this year. It's uh, being published by McFarlane. I'm so excited about it. (laughs) There's also going to be a fair number of papers about The Legend of Zelda in there, which I'm excited about. (laughs) You do have a foot in both worlds. (laughs) I do, yes. I did write a whole book chapter directly comparing Miyamoto and Tolkien, and it made me very, very happy. (laughs) Um, Is there anything else you wanted to tell us about that you have going on Tolkien-related? 
<sighs> Honestly, right now it's mostly just uh, the Mythopoeic Society and uh, and that book that is hopefully coming out soon ish. <laughs> Uh, the Mythopoeic Society stuff eats up a fair amount of my time, honestly. <laughs> well, you know, hats off to you and, and all social media officers. It is a very important job and a very time consuming job and a very underappreciated job. So <laughs> it, it's it's really appreciated what you do. Thank you. Mm hmm. All right. So I just want to thank you once again for joining me tonight. I, I've had so much fun having the chance to talk to you. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me. We are so thankful that we have such gracious scholars and fans who want to share the Tolkien experience with us and with you. We really enjoy making these podcasts, and the fun doesn't stop here. That's right. It continues on social media. You can find us on Facebook as Tolkien Experience and Twitter as at Tolkien EXP. Don't forget to like, follow, share and comment because we love interacting with you just as much as we enjoy talking to our guests. For even more content and to join our fellowship of supporters, check out our Patreon by going to patreon.com slash Tolkien Experience. Finally, you can also follow our personal Twitter accounts. I'm at Luke B. Shelton. I'm at SR Westwick. And I'm at Aaron L. Palmadil. If you have questions or comments, you can send them to us by email at tolkienexperience at gmail.com. If you want to know more about this week's guest, we provide show notes at tolkienexperience.com. You can find the podcast on all major podcast services, including Apple, Stitcher, and YouTube. Please take a moment to rate and review the podcast wherever you listen to it. Thank you for listening to our podcast, and we truly hope that, in a way, it contributes to your own Tolkien experience. <laughs>